So welcome to the virtual book launch for my memoir, Muse Odilisk Handmaiden, A Girl's Life in the Incredible String Band. We were hoping to do a real life book launch, obviously, but since that's not possible, uh, we made this video, which is a bit DIY, which is very much in the original spirit of this incredible string band when I knew it. So first I'm going to read a short passage from the memoir. Then there's a question and answer session uh, based on questions that quite a few people have asked me about the memoir. Then I'm going to introduce three short clips from a previous interview, which was done before I had any idea whatsoever about writing about the string band. And then uh, we end on a, on a song recorded way back when. And I really hope you find it fun. Off we go with the reading. So it was in 1967, after a freezing day on a Scottish mountain, that I first headed for Mary Stuart's Temple Cottage, because mountaineering was my favourite activity at the time. And my anorak, climbing breeches and thick woolly socks were soaking through after a day on the hillside, and all I wanted was to be warm and dry again. And Mary Stuart's name was legendary then amongst the Yorkshire climbing fraternity that I came from and she was strong as an ox, and she'd carried Big Jim McCartney several miles across the moors one day when he'd broken his leg on a climb. Walking up the muddy track to her house, I'd got no idea what to expect. It was in the middle of nowhere. And the front door was open, though, and the porch was full of wellies and old climbing boots and muddy shoes. And children were racing through the stone-flagged hallway. They were chasing a tiny boy who was stumbling over his grown-up shirt. The little girl was waving a fairy wand made out of a paper star on a stick. But she was used to random visitors and took no notice of another one. And Mary was just as unfussy. The sturdy old farmhouse furniture coped with innumerable children and pets. And there were big armchairs and settees with deep, thick cushions and worn upholstery that you could throw yourself into to make a nest against the cold. And nobody there was bothered about damp, muddy trousers or dirty hands. Closing doors was obviously not a household rule either, and the warmth from the arger escaped through the front door as the children ran in and out. The house was chilly and draughty, but no one seemed to notice. If the children stopped long enough to care, they'd just put on another old jumper. And no one had time for housework. And the window sills were a bit dusty and gritty in the corners. One of them was strewn with small bleached bird skulls, dried out flowers, and toys that the children had found. The landscape crept, along with the, crept in along with the souvenirs and stayed there. Newspapers lay dropped in corners for days until they were needed to get the fire going and then they were like gold dust because dry sticks and kindling weren't always available and the old chimneys took some warming up before the fire would take. In the daytime the kitchen was the warmest place with that faint iron and coke smell that was part of the old Argus charm, and there were always socks hanging on the rail in front of it. The handy Betty drying rack hung over the range to be lowered and hauled up again to dry out everyone's clothes, particularly when a gang of climbers just descended upon them. But after a big wash, the smell of clean, wet wool seemed natural and homely, like the sheep outside on the rainy hillsides. But when night closed in, the house felt warmer and looked more cheerful. Lights were turned on with their coloured shades and the faded patterns of cushions and mats, which were dingy in the morning light of a snowy winter, glowed in the firelight. Someone called from the kitchen for hands to peel and chop vegetables and life came in from the outdoor cold as everyone started to congregate for supper. The general moved towards the kitchen, brought out some of the upstairs residents too. Someone told me they were folk singers, but the people that came down the stairs one by one didn't look like folk singers to me. Folk singers wore corduroys and Icelandic sweaters. Folk singers toured all corners of the UK hogging traditional songs to a rowdy audience. They were part of the mountaineering scene, and we scree ran off the hills to get to the pub with its folk club in the back room. And these odd-looking strangers looked too soft and frail to even manage the journeys. But with her long hair framing a pale face, the girl looked folksy and very quaint in that utilitarian household with her long skirts and embroidered jacket. <clears throat> the children called her licorice, but I thought that was just their joke. The two men were even more outlandish, in curious clothes like drawings of medieval minstrels or wandering players. 
The taller, blonde, was Robin. The dark-haired one was Mike. I looked at them with some detachment, as if, as if they'd just walked out of a fairy book. Slightly stooped, Robin Williamson roamed in loosely and erratically, as if by chance, with his long hair falling over his face as he poked around amongst the pots and pans. As ever, his clothes flapped about him as he moved, held together with tags and strings and laces, and a threadbare jacket with missing buttons hung over cotton jeans of an indefinite colour, and a zip that gave up occasionally, and no one was bothered, despite the lack of underwear. And Mike Heron's wide, dark eyes, almost on a level with my own, gazed out of a face that looked to me like the prince in some story of the fairy folk. Films and my mother's magazines had told me I should admire tall, dark and handsome, and that never interested me very much. But this face of wonder entranced me, all, and he was all compact energy and a voice which spoke music veiled in smiles. And I felt like the peasant girl who strayed by accident into the prince's chamber. Yet his soft Scottish accent spoke sense and kindness. And his bright green wool flare struck me as warm and practical for the winter. His shirt was made from an old Victorian nightdress dyed crimson, which was unusual, bizarre even on a man, but he wore it with unassailable composure. He transformed clothes in the wearing of them, and the next day, as he sat playing his guitar in the corner looking out on the frosty landscape, perfectly ordinary trousers and a polo neck jumper looked like fancy dress. There are some questions I've been asked several times about this memoir first one is, had I ever planned to write a memoir? And if so, what finally got me started doing it? Well, in 2018, I went to see a film at the Rio Cinema in Dalston. And this was a film that Adrian Whitaker had put together uh, using the original video uh, footage of that Hoppy Hopkins had made of the show called You that ISB did at the Roundhouse in 1970. And I was amazed by the audience. Well, I was amazed that there was a full house for a start. And I was also astounded that so many people still wanted to watch String Band, hear about it, and were interested to talk to me uh, as someone who'd been there at the time, who knew the band and its music, who had the same enthusiasm for it as they had. Um, so that was the first time. And then shortly after that, I did an interview with Nick Turner, who was making a film about Sound Techniques Recording Studio. And that got me thinking again about the past. And then on top of that, shortly again, Mike Heron told me he was planning to write the second volume of his autobiography, which inevitably would have started with When I Met Rose. Now, I wasn't quite sure how I would feel about that. Um, but it suddenly came to me that the story of Incredible String Band was also my story. And it was perhaps about time that I started to tell how it felt to be that girl living through those amazing years. And then someone asked me, in the course of writing and redrafting the book, uh, had I had any revelations about, um, about my old self and about the nature of the Incredible String Band itself. And or writing the memoir was a strange process. Um, rediscovering, revisiting, reviewing uh, that life that I'd chosen to turn my back on. Well, there were actually no great moments of revelation to me. It was more a reliving, and that was really hard sometimes. And it wasn't, it wasn't the good times. It wasn't the exploding rainbows and the California suns. It was because it reminded me so much of that all being young together and so full of hope and so full of ideas for the future because we really wanted to change the world and the world seemed to be changing around us, not just for us, but for everybody. But we also wanted to play our part in that changing. And I think living alongside Mike and Robin and Licorice, with all that music making and music playing, that experience was even more intense for me. Uh, I think that in doing so, I've, in writing it, I finally laid a few ghosts for myself. I think I certainly feel a lot kinder about us all, um, both back then um, and now, actually, um, because we did have such high hopes together and we did think we were creating something wonderful. 
and touring is a hard life and okay we got very tired we made a lot of mistakes um, but that's not really surprising in the circumstances and I tried to write mostly from memory not looking back at what other people had written about us but I realized also that in in remembering that time I was taking my present self back with me what I didn't reckon on was that I would bring some of that past self back into the present. And for me, that's been a real super gain. I'm not quite sure how other people feel about it. Someone asked me, did writing the book um, get me interested in playing music again? Well, yes, it did actually, um, because I realised how much the music itself had meant to me. Uh, the words have accompanied me through my life. They've been so much part of my life that that was inevitable. But I really thought again how much I liked the actual the tunes then, you know. Uh, and so I dug my old violin out of the attic and Tim Moon showed me how to restring it safely, which was excellent. And so this is my violin. This is the actual violin I played on all those string band tracks that you know, uh, Log Cabin Home and um, Blackjack Davy. Um, and I have enormous fun now playing it and I play it along with YouTube, which is really great. Um, so apart from that, uh, this is my recorder that I played at Woodstock. Um, and this is the little Syrian drum that appears so often in the memoir because it was a very, very precious thing for me um, and still is. But until yesterday, it was actually a decorative feature in my daughter's bathroom, but I went and got it back. Um, the Gibson guitar, this is the Gibson guitar that Mike gave me. Um, that's gone round the family, but now I've reclaimed it and I'm not planning to let it go again. But I don't think I'll be learning to play that because one instrument's quite enough. And then someone also asked me, do I have any plans for another book? Yes, I really do. Um, I'd like to write about is Joe Boyd's Witch Season Productions. And uh, not the music because other people can do that better, but about all the people all the musicians who came and went like we did in between tours and chatting as we passed, but not just the musicians, all the other people that worked around there, the artists and the producers and, and the girls who worked in the office and Anthea and all these people because they were all real personalities and they all had real, really colourful lives. Well, many of them did anyway. And so it's the life stories that I, I think I'd like to write about. I mentioned earlier the interview I did with Nick Turner for the Sound Techniques film and that was very much talking about string band in the context of recording because Sound Techniques was the studio that we recorded quite a lot of the music uh, with Joe Boyd as our record producer and John Wood as the engineer. At the time I had no idea, no idea at all of writing anything on that subject. Uh, so it's quite interesting how it turned out from there. So the first clip is about Robin and Mike. Uh, the second one is about the recording studio and working with Joe Boyd and how that was. And the third one is me starting to remember living that life. I start to get into the more detail of, of what we were wearing and thinking a bit about the good days and the bad days. And it's interesting because suddenly it started to flood back into my mind and I realised how vivid the memories were and how clear the pictures once I opened the door and let myself remember them. It was this wonderful mixture of, 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 of a total romantic, um, romantic looks, you know. I just found him, yeah, beautiful, you know, um, and miniature somehow. And... Um, and, and very, very perfect in a sort of quite a small scale. And I felt that was fascinating, you know. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a look, it was a face that I found fascinating, you know. And, um, but, I, but that, so that, that sort of high romance of the look, you know, and was combined with this very easy personality and uh, just language, just ordinary ordinary and nice and I could understand all that and it was uh, very accessible and you know you could talk about shopping and things that Robin was always a bit you felt you couldn't have really discussed a shopping list with Robin you couldn't say do you think we need to go down the supermarket you know uh, but Mike thought if you could and so that was part of it he was because I mean he you know he he had that 
very sort of solid background really and, and his father was an English teacher you see so you know, it was it was a lot easier somehow you knew where you were no idea what Robin where Robin came from or I didn't know I still don't really know but um, certainly didn't know then he just existed as a sort of floating presence now that that was all whereas Mike had a, a, a context for me much more claiming to be different, whereas Mike was always very willing to be, yeah, get on with stuff, you know. Robin, in a way, claimed to be the sort of the seer, the prophet, the, um, the voice, of, voice of the future or whatever, or the present, you know. And that I find mildly difficult to deal with um, because I had enough critical sense to realise that that gurus were not my thing, you know, and uh, I thought that there was stepping towards that, you know, and th but that's not that's the sort of that's also a bias because it's not true. There was lots of times when he wasn't that. There was lots of times when we were just young people together, you know. But somehow in the background there was always this didactic feeling with Robin, and that that. Um, he was claiming difference in a way that Mike never did, you know, and that uh, he was also a much more dominant personality, you know, and and very, he believed, uh, probably still does believe, that he could access things that were not available to ordinary people, of which I was one, of course. It was quite dark and it was quite uh, not very tidy particularly and it was a bit kind of dusty and a bit sort of grubby but that was rather nice because it was just like it was just like an extension of the street almost so in the same way that at the time I would have if if the mood took me you know and, and it had been hot I would have sat down on King's Road and had a cup of tea if I felt like it you sat down there and it didn't matter what the floor whether the floor was because we didn't care um, I wasn't I didn't have any clothes that couldn't put up with sitting in the dirt and you just sat you know and but upstairs was special because that's where all the technical things happened and there it was very much whereas the downstairs space was our space um, because we were clearly the main point of downstairs you know because upstairs only functioned as long as we were downstairs you know uh, upstairs was their space and this was the uh, this was where it was I never would have gone in there without someone taking me. I wouldn't have felt I could go in there on my own unless actually someone had called me up, you know. But I, it was very much, uh, yeah, hallowed ground then, you know, and very much a space in which I didn't know what was happening, but I could see that, that it was. And I, of course, Joe was the link between the two spaces, you know. And so, to that extent, I was aware of, and you know, all these with all the things spinning round, you know, and so visually, again, again, a visual impression of 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 work, what work was, this working space. It was a working environment, and I liked it because of that. I liked it because this was, yeah, work going on, you know, and something happening, and and it and it seemed. It seemed so easy. It seemed so easy. And, and watching them move the slide things up and down on the desk and, and I, I kind of hearing and, and, and listening to them talking about, well, we should bring that up and bring that down and, and then and putting, the, putting the, whatever you call them, the spools or whatever you call them, back on the machines and all that. Uh, yeah, visually it was it was interesting, but mainly it was just like home. And what happened about the noises that we must have made? Because given that we were all wearing full hippie regalia, which meant loads of things that made a noise, you know, every time I moved my arm it must have jangled because of bracelets and bangles and beads and earrings and, 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 and clothes that were, must have swished. 
you know. And you do wonder what they did with all that noise. Because we must have been very noisy and we kept falling over everything, you know, and dropping things. And they must have spent hours trying to sort out all these funny noises. Because, you know that Neil Planer thing, the hurdy-gurdy mushroom man? You know that? Well... I mean, that was so true. <laughs> it was so true. I thought that was wonderful because it was very, it, you know, it was, it was just what it was. You know, we did trip over things and, and Licky and I were, you know, we had rows and behind the amp, you know, and, and not very noisy rows, but we were, but the feeling was there, if not the words, you know. And then, you know, when some boyfriend had gone, there was sort of snivelling behind the amp. And all, I mean, all this was a noise. And all this happened in sound techniques, like it happened on any stage or, or any front room. Uh, because uh, th this is the whole point, really. This was life, you know. This was not, for me, that, that's the difference between me and, and, you know, the musicians, in a way. For me, this was yet another aspect of my life that went on very much with very little distinction from the other ones. I mean, it, it was almost like you go into a restaurant, you go into a, a studio, this is certain different things happen, but life goes on. Yeah, I sort of remember playing Log Cabin Home in the Sky in a studio because that was playing the fiddle. And so, you know, the nervous tension of actually trying to get the notes right you know, was very much there with that, you know. And, and that was, yeah, I, I regarded that as something, if I got that right, I was delighted, you know, in tune. Um, and just sawing away, it was funny really, because I was always aware, when I heard them back, you could hear, there's no, you, can, you know, I'm not that daft, you know, I can hear what I do. Um, but I was just pleased to be able to do that, you know, to get through it playing in tune. I know it's, but, and Robin, and that was always a joy of playing with other musicians because, of course, people who are good at it, they can make you sound so good, you know. So actually, Log Cabin Home in the Sky with Robin fiddling all around, you know, me sort of sawing away on the, <laughs> but Robin making it sound great. That was wonderful. I liked that. And I always liked that. And I also remember in Sound Techniques playing on that Smiling Men with Dave Mattox playing drums and I was playing bass. And I felt, I thought, that's it, I'm a bass player. And I got no illusions about the, that I was only a bass player on that track because that was the only one I could do, you know, uh, with a proper drummer. But it suddenly felt like a, a real musician, you know, for that, for that space of that track because it is fantastic being a bass player, playing with a drummer when they're good at it and they can make the best of you because people who are skilled can make the best of the ones who aren't and that was a wonderful joy and that was a wonderful joy listening to listening to things in the studio because your my contribution took on this whole glory that 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 was lent from the other skill but it was wonderful I'm now going to play a recording of a song which Mike wrote for me and which was part of that You Show that we did at the Roundhouse. It was also part of a song and dance routine which was quite funny really. Um, the photos which fly over it are all from the memoir and I found all of these, like the instruments, um, in a bag at the bottom of a cupboard but I'm pleased to say that they're now all in a nice album. And the song is called Walking Along With You.
so that's it so thank you very much for watching um, I hope you enjoyed to hear a bit more about the incredible string band from my point of view so the memoir Muse Odalisque Handmaiden A Girl's Life in the Incredible String Band is available now um, on the Strange Attractor website that's the hardback limited edition uh, the paperback which will I hope be available in January uh, is on the usual websites and I hope will be in some bookstores as well so again thanks a lot for being there and goodbye <laughs>